All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Max Ran, and I'm an AmeriCorps member uh, serving with NWA. I've been serving with them since August of last year, and I've really enjoyed my time with them. I've learned so much about plants, more than I had known before, because I'm sort of a novice, but I look forward to giving this presentation. And it's called It's a Match. Um, it's a workshop to learn about pollinator plants and its lovers, as you can see. There's a nice picture of a bee uh, pollinating right there. And we have uh, some pollinator plants uh, on the side right there. So why are pollinators important? Well, the pollination process allows for flowers to reproduce and produce enough seeds for both dispersal and propagation. It also helps to maintain ecosystems and allows for successful ecological functions so when you're thinking about organisms, they need a lot within their ecosystems to have their functions fully, um, fully um, just at their disposal. Um, so with pollinators, they rely heavily on pollinator plants. And of course, having native pollinator plants is especially important so that they're getting uh, great resources to help fuel before migration and to just be a great home to them while they're here. Pollination also allows for the production of countless crops all around the world. And for that reason, among many others, uh, our world would be com completely flipped upside down without them. And as you can see on the side here, there's a photo of a bee. Uh, I put the caption Eureka, uh, just finding, uh, you know, finding what it's looking for. So that's a happy bee. So let's talk a little bit about food production. At least 75% 75, 75 of the world's crops uh, producing fruits and seeds for human consum consumption depend in part on pollinators. Um, so you can see on the, on the side, there are um, some apples, some grapes, cherries, strawberries, pears, and lemons. So these are all reliant upon pollinators in the pollination process. And ultimately, um, it, uh, less pollinators lead to greater food insecurity. And through pollinators, uh, carrying pollen from one flower to another, it can help to contribute to and improve food production. So ultimately, I mean, just for food production without pollinators, um, it, it would just be a completely different world and it'd be uh, much bleaker as far as um, having access to it. So that's why pollinators are so important and pollinator plants are um, so important. Uh, migration is also a huge part of the pollinator's um, life. So many of our native pollinators, such as the monarch, travel thousands of miles during their migrations. So you can see on the side here, there's a photo of, um, there's two maps. Um, well, it has the monarchs uh, going north and it has the monarchs going south towards Mexico. So when they migrate, they go down to central Mexico and then they uh, go back up north from central Mexico. Hummingbirds also uh, use up a lot of energy when they're migrating, um, and they will typically gain 25% to 40% of their body weight before migration. And that's why it's so important for hummingbirds, as well as many other pollinators, to have that food source, because they definitely need to fuel up after um, or before a very long trip. Um, because some of these pollinators, as I mentioned, such as the monarch, travel thousands of miles. Uh, for moss, it is assumed that they hitch a ride in favorable winds when migrating. And for example, the silver Y moth takes fast, high altitude winds. So let's talk about some pollinator species. Of course, we have butterflies and bees. Those are the two really big ones, but there are some that I think a lot of people may uh, forget about. We of course have moss, we have, uh, we have flies and wasps, or we have wasps, we have hummingbirds, and we have beetles. And the hummingbird pictured here is the ruby-throated ruby hummingbird, which is native to this area. And I will talk about it now, or talk about it soon. So um, as I mentioned, uh, ruby-throated hummingbird are uh, native to this area. And so is the Baltimore checker spot uh, bumblebee, and there's many types of bumblebee. Eastern tiger swallowtail, and monarchs, of course. So let's talk a little bit about the ruby-throated hummingbird. It spends its winters in Central America, Mexico, and Florida. It migrates to Canada and Eastern North America for the summer. 
it will usually arrive in Delaware in March to early May to breed. So if you're looking for a ruby-throated ruby hummingbird, uh, you can expect it, expect to see it in March if you have the necessary, necessary resources for it to come to your area or to come to your garden. And a fun fact is that is the it is the most common hummingbird seen east of the Mississippi River. And obviously, I think the ruby, the you can tell where the name comes from, the ruby-throated, and I think it just looks uh, really cool. So it's definitely one of my favorite pollinators. Now, its match is red columbine. Uh, the plant is also a favorite of bumblebees and other long-tongued insects. It grows well in both shade and sun with proper moisture. Blooming occurs late spring. And a fun fact about red columbine is that parts of the plants were used in herbal remedies by Native American tribes to treat headaches, sore throats, and fevers. And on the side, you can just see uh, the ruby-throated hummingbird. It has a long tongue and it has a fork-shaped tongue, so it can just uh, lap up a lot of nectar very quickly. Um, so it's very efficient when it comes to pollinating. We also have the Baltimore checker spot. Now it has a very, na uh, very uh, vast uh, native range. It stretches south from Canada to the Eastern United States, Virginia and the North Carolina mountains and west to the Great Lakes region. Throughout its history, the species uh, distri distribution of Maryland has spanned 15 counties. So at one point it's sort of more considered as a local species, but through plants such as the white turtle head white, and white ash, it has quickly become more widespread throughout the entire United States. Unfortunately though, it is listed as rare, threatened and endangered on the Maryland DNR's animal list. But a fun fact is that the species name comes from the first Lord Baltimore this family crest bears a similarity in its colors. And as you can also see, it has a, a similar color scheme to the Oriole, which is of course the state bird of Maryland. And it also bears a similar, similarity to the state cat of Maryland, which I didn't even know we had a state cat, but it's the, the calico, calico cat, um, in case you're uh, interested in looking up, up a picture of the calico cat. <laughs> And its match is the white turtle head, as I mentioned. Uh, the plant is pollinated mainly uh, by bumblebees, but it's also enjoyed by butterflies and hum hummingbirds. It, <clears throat> sorry, it is a native in Georgia and is found as Northeast as Newfoundland and Labrador. So it goes up, it can be found uh, pretty uh, up North um, and blooming occurs in late summer. And a fun fact is that the common name refers to the flower petals, which resemble the head of a tortoise. So if you look at a photo of a white turtle head, you'll see that the flower head uh, sort of looks like a turtle head and that's how it gets its name. So I think that's pretty fun. We of course have the bumblebee and there are several hundreds of species of bumblebees all throughout the world. Now, bumblebees, they aren't aggressive and likely to sting as hornets and yellow, jacks, yellow jackets. So if you do, do, if you do see a bumblebee, uh, just know that um, to not like um, disturb it at all um, because it is not aggressive. So it's just doing its thing. It's just um, trying to pollinate or just get along. So just keep that in mind when you do see a bumblebee. Uh, its long tongue helps to feed on honeysuckle, catmint, and columbine. And a fun fact is that there are no native species in Australia, and they are also absent from most of Africa, but throughout most of the world, they can be found. And as I mentioned, there are hundreds of different species of bumblebees out there. A native uh, match for the bumblebee is wild bergamot. It also attracts several different pollinators. And for grazers such as deers and rabbits, um, they avoid the plant which is also good. So you won't have that disturbance from deers or rabbits. Um, and this is because of its, of its strong flavor. The plant has numerous benefits such as serving as a honey plant, medicinal plant and ornamental. And blooming occurs between midsummer to late summer. And a fun fact is a bath with the plant leaves was believed to cure chills, which I thought was a very interesting method, I have to say. We of course have Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. 
So the males are always yellow, while the females may either be yellow or black. Additionally, the female has a blue mark on its tails. So you can see on the photo to the side that this is a female Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. It is commonly found in the Eastern United States with a wide reaching native range that includes uh, southern, southern Vermont to Florida and west to Eastern Texas and the Great Plains. So it has a very vast native range. Host plants include wild black cherry, ash, tulip poplar and sweet bay magnolia. And a fun fact is that it is the state butterfly of three states, Alabama, North Carolina, and South Carolina. And so I will talk about sweet bay magnolia, which is its uh, match, its native match. It is a host plant for also for Palamedes uh, swallowtail, spicebush uh, swallowtail, and sweet bay silk moth. Other pollinators such as hummingbirds and beetles are attracted to the high protein uh, pollen that the flower produces. And blooming occurs late spring to late summer. Uh, fun fact is that Native Americans use the crust seeds as a love, as a love charm. And an interesting uh, fact about Sweet Bay Magnolia is that further down south, it grows taller up to 60 feet but as you go up north, it will typically, typically grow between 20 to 40 feet. So it has an interesting sort of a dichotomy between uh, south and north when uh, considering the tree's height. We also, of course, have monarchs. Uh, monarchs can only lay eggs on milkweed. So it is, essentially, it is essential for monarchs to have access to milkweed. It is most commonly found east of the Rocky Mountains and can be found throughout most of the United States and Central America. They are, however, poisonous. So some animals may eat a monarch and become very sick and then they subsequently avoid it. So if a deer um, you know, or some other um, animal tries to eat a monarch, it will become very sick. And so that animal will likely not return to that garden, at least when the, uh, when the monarchs are out. And a fun fact is that monarchs can travel as far as 100 miles a day throughout its 3000 mile migration. So that is obviously quite the workout. So it definitely needs a good source um, for feeding before its migrations. And that is of course milkweed. Um, specifically, uh, I have swamp milkweed here. Uh, milkweed is of course the host plant for the monarch butterfly. Uh, swamp milkweed also attracts bumblebees, hummingbirds, and moss. Blooming occurs between mid to late summer. And a fun fact is that Iroquois and Meskwaki use the roots and other parts of the plant as a deworming agent. And this is, uh, well, milkweed is obviously uh, very uh, colorful, and so it will be a great addition to uh, your pollinator garden. So there are, of course, more native pollinator plants that I wanted to touch on. Uh, pictures of these plants and brief information about them can be found through our social media posts, uh, wildflower, hashtag Wildflower Wednesday. On the side, I've included uh, one of our posts, a photo of one of our posts. So I have Aster here. Um, and so if you want to like look at some more pollinator plants, you can just go on our social media, search Wildflower Wednesday, and you'll be able to discover a lot of uh, pollinators, uh, sorry, pollinator plants, as well as um, some information about them and fun facts as well. And of course, having these native pollinator plants will allow for a more efficient ecosystem for pollinators. So let's talk about a few. We of course have purple coneflower. The plant attracts a variety of butterflies like fritillaries, monarchs, and painted ladies. It is native to Eastern and Central North America. Blooming occurs between midsummer and fall. And a fun fact is that the genus name comes from the Greek echinos, meaning hedgehog, which is a reference to the brownish central disc, which if you're looking at it from a very long distance from very far away, you may see it, you may mistake it for hedgehog, but um, that's sort of where it gets its name from, which I thought was pretty cool. We also have cardinal flower. This is definitely one of my favorite uh, flowers. I just think it looks really cool. And it also attracts ruby-throated hummingbirds, which um, as I stated earlier, is definitely one of the coolest pollinators I can think of. So it serves as an important nectar source for ruby-throated ruby hummingbirds. 
The plant can be found up north in Canada and as far down south as Colombia, so it has a very vast range. Blooming occurs in late summer. And a fun fact is that the plant had previously been used for relieving cramps and the upset stomach. We also have Eastern, da Eastern Daisy flea Fleabane. The plant attracts a variety of bees such as carpenter, cuckoo, and sweat bees. It is native to North America found within 43 of the with, with found in 43 of the 48 states within the contiguous United States and blooming occurs between late spring to midsummer. A fun fact is that the plant name comes from the belief that the flowers actually repel fleas. So, I thought it was very interesting. We of course have to include black-eyed Susan, which is iconic in Maryland, of course, as it has been the state flower since 19, official state flower since 1918. The plant also in, uh, attracts searfid flies, soldier beetles, skippers, moss, and various types of bees. The plant can be found throughout most of the United States and the blooming occurs between May and August. We also have a, another type of milkweed, a uh, butterfly milkweed. So this serves as a food source for queen and monarch butterflies, dogbane tiger moth, and milkweed tussock moth. Much like wild bergamot, the plant is typically rabbit and deer resistant. So that's another po uh, positive if you're thinking of including it within your pollinator garden. Blooming for this plant occurs between mid to late summer. And a fun fact is that Native Americans and European, European pioneers used to, used to boil roots for respiratory illness treatment. So some questions to consider before starting your pollinator garden. You wanna think about how much of the area is currently covered by flowering plants and are there invasive weeds? So you may not know that some of the plants in your garden are actually invasives. So you always wanna be sure when you're uh, just like looking through before starting a project to see if these are in fact invasives. And of course you wanna remove those before starting your pollinator project. Another thing to consider is if there's an elevation to the area where erosion may cause a disturbance. Additionally, are there already nearby nesting habitats? If so, it's good to leave them there so that the, org so that the organisms that are already um, relying upon those nests, that they have those functions, that they have those nests available already. And just including the new pollinators will just help to add to their resources. Additionally, you want to find out if an adjacent side is using pesticides or if there may be in invasive weeds on their side that may impact your project. So some tips for locations outside of crop fields. It is ideal to leave any existing nesting habitats as it will help to maintain long-term satisfaction for pollinators, as I mentioned. So just having those nests already will allow for those organisms to have a fully functioning routine so that they're already used to those nests, but now that you're implementing new pollinators, they can adapt to that pretty quickly. Also adding wildflower strips or roadside ditches allows for an increase in pollinator diversity. And it's not mentioned here, but I did want to mention that we have a designer ditch page on our website at nanacookriver.org where you can learn about designer ditches, which essentially are native plants planted in ditches, which help to reduce erosion and flooding or prevent flooding. And it just helps to create a beautiful landscape within the ditch so that you're making good use of the ditch while also promoting uh, some beautification as well as resources for pollinators as well. And again, that's available at nanacookriver.org. Tips for locations within crop fields, uh, intercrop, cover cropped or adopt attractive pollinator plants to have a diverse community. Having a diverse range of pollinators within your pollinator uh, area will allow for a variety of pollinators to, of course, uh, function within that ecosystem. And it will just help to attract uh, several different uh, organisms. Crops such as clovers serve both grazers and pollinators, for example. It is also important to reduce tillage intensity because even though it can make the soil more accessible to bees, it can also disturb established nests. 
And as I touched on earlier, it's just good to have the established nest undisturbed when you start your project um, because it will just allow for them to have that, maintain that routine that they already have while also adapting to a new ecosystem that will uh, give them several new benefits. Some general maintenance tips. It is important to not disturb the soil once the garden is established because there may be um, earthworms or there may be other organisms that are reliant upon the soil. And by disturbing the soil, it can disrupt their patterns, their routines, and we don't want that to happen. It is important to remove weeds by hand and, avoid, and to avoid pesticides and herbicides as best you can. Because um, you know, if you use pesticides and herbicides and other chemicals, it will uh, disrupt the livelihood of those pollinators. It is also important to deadhead to ensure that adamant to ensure abundant or sorry abundant flower production, and deadheading can also prevent um, disease as well as uh, pest infestation. And just generally speaking, it's just good to keep an eye out for garden pests uh, pretty routinely, just to make sure that you know if you take a, a while to like look at your pollinator plant, like after two weeks or three weeks or maybe even a month just to make sure that it, the, the area hasn't been disturbed to a great degree because you don't want to have that go un, unnoticed, unchecked because the pollinators will definitely want to have, you know, a fully functioning ecosystem and to have pests disturbing the garden will uh, um, prevent them from doing just that. So a pollinator plan, this is a front yard formal full sun and this includes black-eyed Susan, butterfly and milkweed, and purple coneflower, which are all, of course, very attractive to the eye, very colorful, and as I mentioned earlier, attracts many different types of pollinators and has many different benefits uh, for several different uh, organisms, different pollinators. So right here is Max's plan. I am not a homeowner. I, um, in a, I live in an apartment, but if I were sort of role playing as a homeowner, and uh, this is uh, a home that I found on Google Maps, where it has a sort of large space. So let's think about how I would transform this into my pollinator area. I would start by creating a small bed that consists of carnauflower, black eyed Susans, butterfly milkweed, and purple coneflower. As I mentioned earlier, carnauflower is definitely one of my favorite flowers. Also, black-eyed Susans are just iconic for Maryland, and I really enjoy milkweeds, and purple coneflower just look really nice as well. I would also go ahead and plant a tulip poplar and sweet bay magnolia. Tulip poplar, of course, can, go, can grow very high, up to about 150 feet, so it has a very tall vertical, um, well, it grows very tall. Um, so if you have the space to grow, but to grow a tulip poplar, it will help to provide a host plant for the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail while also uh, producing many benefits towards pollinators. And that would also include a uh, sweet babe magnolia as well, just because I think that is a very uh, unique looking tree. And uh, I think it would just be a great addition to this landscape. So some final tips before you start your project. As I mentioned, it's good to choose a variety of colors and shapes that will attract many different types of pollinators. It is also good to choose plants that bloom at different times to ensure that nectar and pollen sources provide pollinators throughout the growing season. Uh, because, of course, when they're migrating, before their long migrations, they wanna have all of these different uh, nectar sources and pollen sources before they go out to mi uh, migrate. So having a uh, year round uh, pollinator plants will provide that benefit. And it is also important to plant in clumps as opposed to solo as it will attract pollinators better. And it's now time to create your pollinator garden. Uh, this is Carla from Laurel. She has a, she had a partial shade uh, pollinator garden, which we helped uh, to uh, implement. And of, as you can see in the photo, she's very happy with the final outcome. We also help to remove at, at least 30 bags, uh, 30 compactor bags of invasives in the backyard. So um, if we come for a home visit, we like to be very efficient 
And we like to, of course, uh, leave the homeowners very satisfied with the fin uh, final product. So with that, uh, here are some resources. We have native landscape plans, which is where I got the formal sun plan, as well as just uh, that I have many other different types of, types of plans. So if you're looking for different types of pollinators, that's a good resource to go to. Uh, also is Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. This is a very detailed, very vast uh, resource for just looking up different types of pollinators that you may want to include in your garden. I also included Delaware native plants for native bees. So as the name suggests, this has native plants that will attract native bees. And more on that matter, uh, there's also farm management for native bees, a guide to Delaware. I also included why bees matter. Of course, bees are an extremely important pollinator, perhaps the sort of flagship pollinator that you may think of. And I also included a resource for pollinator-friendly garden maintenance as well. And with that, I can take any questions that anybody has, and thank you. Welcome to Massive Meadows. Um, first of all, what are meadows? So they're extremely valuable and rare, but we're seeing them more now. Um, open habitat and meadows are for non-woody plants. So that means that herbaceous perennials and annuals, which are our forbs, and also grasses are a really crucial part of meadows. And in order for us to keep just our non-woody plants, we need to regularly maintain to prevent succession and to prevent nasty invasive plant species from taking root. Meadows can exist in either full sun or part sun conditions. If you have full shade, you'll want to try a woodland garden instead. So again, lots of different plants can grow in shady conditions, um, but it's not really a meadow. It's a different type of garden. Meadows can thrive in either dry, or I should say from a wide range of dry all the way to wet conditions. Um, I will say from experience that seeding a wet meadow is a lot more uh, tricky than seeding a drier meadow. So there will be more challenges. And also if you don't have a huge chunk of property um, that you can devote to a meadow, you can also put in a pocket meadow, which is you know, a much smaller um, area. It has certain advantages. Um, you can use plugs, for example, as opposed to seeding. It's easier to prep the site and maintain the site as well. So why a meadow? And of course the question should be, why not a meadow? Especially if you have a lot of lawn, why keep that much lawn? Um, is it useful? Some small amount of lawn may be great in terms of, you know, if you have children or if you use it for different recreational purposes. But in a lot of cases, we Americans, we just have a lot of lawn. So devoting that lawn to a meadow could provide a lot of different benefits, um, not just critical habitat for our awesome native pollinators that Max was talking about, but also a bunch of other insects, our great songbirds who we love seeing in our yard and also small mammals. It's an excellent, a meadow is an excellent source of food, also provides us critical host plants because we wanna have pollen and nectar, but we also need to have host plants for our butterfly and moth species. And meadows provide great cover for insects and birds. A meadow, once it's established, so much easier to maintain. It's a lot cheaper to maintain, um, less time intensive, less water intensive, and it's a lot more friendly to all the critters who are in our backyard or front yard communities. It also is better for water quality than a traditional lawn. My opinion, a meadow is a gorgeous thing and it beautifies your landscape. And you can really get a huge bang for your buck and have a long-term impact if you properly maintain your meadow. So for meadows, there are certain things that you need to have in order to 
pursue a meadow? First of all, you need some space. So we're talking about large places today. So we're assuming that we can check that one off the list. Next, again, we need to have a full sun or a partial sun set up. So that means anywhere um, I would recommend four hours of, of sunlight or more per day. A meadow is not for those looking for short-term gratification. It's a long game. And especially if you seed the meadow, it's really going to take about three years for that meadow to um, be at optimal condition where you're getting um, some great flowers and you're seeing a lot of activity. The first year in particular, those native plants are mostly going to be putting energy into their roots. There are some plants that will give you flowers the first year. The Monarda species are excellent in doing that. Throwing in a native annual like partridge pea is great to make sure that you're getting some first year flowers as well. And next, you really need to have the will to do this. So there is um, certain maintenance that has to be done. There's site prep, which is the single most important thing that you can do to ensure that your meadow is going to thrive. But you really need to be a willful, dri driven person. And this meadow needs to be um, really important in order for it to be a success. If you decide, hey, that sounds like me. I've got, I've got the drive. I've got the resources. I have all of these things that I've checked off the list and I want to put a meadow into play. The next thing you have to decide is, do you want to seed the area or do you want to use plugs? And there are advantages and disadvantages of both. Um, and, you know, seeds are definitely, that's your practical way to cover a large area. Um, and it's, it's just a lot cheaper and it's a lot easier logistically to seed as opposed to planting thousands and thousands of plugs. You will usually need to compromise on the specific plant selection. Um, Ernst Seeds and Prairie Moon, for example, they both have different types of seed mixes. Ernst has a really great pollinator mix. Um, but it may not have all the plants that you want, and there may be some plants where you're kind of meh about those plants, but that's the best way to stretch your budget. You also need to blend it with a cover crop, and again, both of those companies provide a cover crop. Ernst is really great when you talk to them because they can help you make your calculations so that you know how much um, how many pounds of cover crop you'll need with your other pounds of, uh, say, pollinator mix. Keep in mind with seeds, it will take, again, two to three years for most plants to be at their fullest and raring to go when you're getting nice flowering. Plugs, on the other hand, are practical only for smaller areas due to the cost and also the labor required. Um, to plant plugs. So if you're putting in a pocket meadow, I definitely recommend that you use plugs. Plugs, of course, are going to cost you more than buying um, however many pounds of seeds that you need. However, with plugs, you can be very, very specific in your plant selection and also where you plant them. So if you want to have more control over the actual look of the meadow, plugs are definitely the way to go. Plugs also hit that instant gratification button because you're going to get flowers much earlier than seeds. So selecting a seed mix. Um, first of all, again, mixes instead of selecting per species. It's a lot cheaper. Um, again, a lot more practical the suitable species for those conditions. So usually it's dry or wet. So they're already pre-selected. You don't really have to do a lot of research in that area. Um, those mixes are also balanced in terms of your seed percentages and they're ready to order as is. You can also build your own, but that's gonna be really expensive. And you're also going to need a larger area 
um, because most companies don't, Ernst, for example, they will do half pounds here and there with their mixes, but for the most part, they only sell in pound increments. And you may think, well, a pound of seeds, that doesn't sound like a lot, but some of our native species, a pound of seeds is quite a bit. So that is something that you have to take into consideration. And it is more complicated due to the different seed sizes and the weights of seeds. And you would definitely want to work with someone, a professional, an expert at a place like Ernst to make sure that you're getting the mix that you need. We recommend that you order 10 to 15% more seed than is needed. And of course, the, the seed that you need is based on the area of the meadow. And then make sure that you also include a cover crop with that. And again, highly recommend Ernst Seeds, which is based out of Pennsylvania. And a, pretty much their seeds are regional ecotypes. So you may be getting seeds from Pennsylvania, Virginia, um, Maryland, et cetera. Prairie Moon is an awesome site. Um, I've bought a lot of uh, smaller amounts of seed from them and have started from seed. But keep in mind that they are a Minnesota-based company, so home of the, the really true prairie. And so a lot of their seed um, come from Midwestern states as opposed to Mid-Atlantic. So just keep that in mind. If you decide that you want to um, use plugs, I recommend choosing um, 10 to 15 plant and grass species. Um, if it's a very small pocket meadow, you may not need quite as many. Um, but I do recommend including a couple of grass species to diversify the meadow. That's also gonna provide food for birds in the winter, and it's going to give some cover to insects and other small mammals. And especially over the winter, that is such crucial habitat. You want to choose plants that are going to provide nectar and pollen throughout the season. So our queen bumblebees, they arise in March and they're starving. They've, you know, they've been hibernating all winter. So if you can have some food for them in March, that is great because they're going to go out and they want to stuff their faces and then start gathering pollen so that they can create some worker bees to go out and do that work as she just continues to create new bees throughout the season. And generally speaking, we want things to bloom through November. We also want to choose plants that are going to act as, as those vital host plants for our butterflies and moths. So with herbaceous perennials, we're really talking about plants like our milkweeds or plant species um, in large groups like milkweeds, asters, goldenrods, joe pie weed, et cetera. To me, the best plants are those that provide multiple functions. You're getting a lot of bang for your blooming buck. So those are great. And there are some excellent plants that do multiple things. Those host plants, for example, are great to include in your meadow because of that reason. They're host plants and they're also nice nectar and pollen providers. This is really important. It's great to the conservation landscaping book that I talked about is great that it has so many plants, but some of those plants you're not gonna be able to find at nurseries or online or even find seeds for them. So you want to make sure that in practical terms, you choose plants that are readily available. And you want to make sure that those plants are suitable for the site conditions. So again, primarily we're looking at the amount of light. So again, part sun or full sun and moisture anywhere from dry to wet, depending on what your site conditions are. I highly recommend purchasing deep plugs. Um, they are just so much better than your standard 72 um, plug trays. The deep plugs have very extensive root systems. You're getting really ahead of the game as it were because they've already put a lot of energy into growing roots. So 
that's going to help with that instant gratification side. And you're also getting very healthy plants. Those deep plug trays come in 32 or 50. Um, so again, I highly recommend that you look for those. If you cannot find them, you can use the 72 plug trays. And those are kind of like the old school standards. And they're fine. They just don't have the extensive root systems that the deep plugs do. I recommend planting very densely, more densely than recommended spacing um, to prevent unwanted plant invaders. So, and I also recommend this in any sort of um, situation where you are going to, um, you've either removed invasive plant species um, or there's the potential for them to come in, densely planting is the way to go. We want to outcompete the thugs. An option to lower your cost, although this um, requires a lot of prior planning, is to grow your own plugs. So you can save a lot of money by buying seeds. Um, if you don't have plug trays already, acquiring them, getting some uh, growing medium, and setting everything up. I highly recommend if you're going to do this to uh, get your seeds in the late summer, early autumn, and go ahead and set them up for um, stratification, scarification naturally over the winter months. And that is exactly what I did last autumn is I bought um, quite a few seeds from Prairie Moon. Um, and I have also done refrigerate refrigerator-based stratification. Um, it's easy, but it requires a lot more hands-on labor. So I like being a lazy gardener. So being a lazy gardener means that I let mother nature do the heavy lifting. So again, recommend late summer, autumn, getting everything set up, sprinkle a couple of seeds to each cell, um, sprinkle a little bit of medium over the seeds and then water it well. I did put um, some of my tomato cages, which are made out of hardware cloth. I put them on their side and put them over the trays just to protect them um, during the winter to make sure they weren't an easy target for birds um, primarily um, so that I would get some uh, plants this spring. Um, and again, that's going to take care of any scarification or stratification needs. And I will say that many native plants do have stratification needs. Prairie Moon is really excellent in giving you the exact information that you need in order to successfully start seeds. They're very, very specific and highly recommended for that reason. Um, from there, once the spring hits, as it has this year, you're going to grow out plants. You may need to thin out um, some of your cells. You may need, as they grow, to pot them up um, so that they have more room to expand their root system. And then once they have a certain um, robustness to them, you can plant them when they are ready and you are ready and your site is ready. If you plant seeds or if you buy seeds in late winter or early spring, you'll need to mimic stratification by refrigerating. And again, Prairie Moon has great information on how to do that. These are some of my favorites. And of course, everybody has their own favorites. But these are some of the ones that I really like. And I'm going to start with grasses. And I recommend that you choose at least one grass species, but maybe up to three depending on the, the site and the size of the site. Little blue stem is my heavy hitter, it's my go-to. I always include little blue stem. Um, it only gets a couple of feet high. It's gorgeous all year round as far as I'm concerned. Um, it provides some great seeds for birds over the winter. And then you also have these little tufts at the bottom where you can have your insects have a nice hiding and safe spot to go in the winter. Big blue stem is of course much bigger. Um, you'll notice that three of these species are considered to be aggressive and you should only plant them in large meadows because they will be 
um, thuggish, as we call our native plant species that are aggressive, um, big blue stem, Indian grass, and also switchgrass. They're great, but again, you need a lot of space to support those species. Poverty oat grass is another um, grass type that is, is not thuggish, so it's also a good choice. And again, it's gonna provide some great seed for your songbirds as well as the cover for insects. For dry forbs, so these are our annuals and perennials. Um, I would say, you know, it really depends, but anywhere from six to 12 species include. And I've got your milkweeds here, so dry milkweeds, um, common milkweed. I'm not a huge fan of it. It is a thuggish, thuggish species, that along with your tall sunflower. Um, Helianthus do tend to be fairly aggressive as well, from my experience. Um, again, you're only going to want to plant those in your larger meadows. Butterfly milkweed is gorgeous. Love the orange. It's much smaller. It's not a thug. So if you have a smaller area, go with the butterfly milkweed. Sweet Joe Pie, awesome scent, vanilla-y, um, just, uh, you know, the, all the Joe Pies are pollinator magnets, and it's also a great host plant. New England Aster, showy goldenrod, gorgeous, definitely not, does not have the reputation of other um, goldenrod species as far as being thuggish and really aggressive. So, and it's gorgeous, just gorgeous display of flowers. And it's right there at the end of the season when everything from monarchs to um, queens to be, so your queen bumblebees to be, they're out there gorging so that they can make it through the winter. So definitely want to have a goldenrod. A bee balm I also recommend because you're going to get flowers that first year, more than likely. I love little spotted bee balm, looks like little pineapples almost, very fragrant, the same as your wild bergamot or your standard bee balm, has that same scent, but it looks totally different. Um, wild bergamot or bee balm, also recommend in this situation. Northern Blazing Star, Foxglove Beard Tongue, Nice annual like partridge pea, such a huge fan of partridge pea. Again, you're gonna get flowers the first year because it is an annual, but it readily self seeds. Um, again, tall sunflower if you have the space. Lance leaf coreopsis is the last recommendation. For moist and wet areas, um, Swamp milkweed, which is uh, probably my favorite of our native milkweeds, gorgeous plant, blooms are incredible, and it brings all the pollinators to your house. Coastal Joe Pie, um, which is Eupatorium dubium, it loves the moister, wetter conditions. Again, another gorgeous plant, uh, it keeps the pollinators very, very happy and well fed. New England aster is a good uh, suitable aster again for these conditions. For your goldenrods, unfortunately, we don't have such a great choice as our showy, but stiff goldenrod, it is somewhat, is thuggish, let's be clear. So you need to have a lot of space or you need to be able to deadhead it um, to prevent those seeds from going everywhere. Um, or early goldenrod, which spreads by runners or rhizomes. So you would need to um, divide it every three or four years. For our moist wet areas, our standard bee balm or wild bergamot would be our um, selection here. Dense blazing star works incredibly well in moist conditions. Swamp sunflower is gorgeous and it's a nice late blooming uh, flower, but again, it's very thuggish, so you need to have the room for it. And great blue lobelia, um, I also recommend here. You could also fit in Max's favorite, the cardinal flower in this mix as well. So highly recommend that you seed or plant the site in the autumn um, because it's going to take care of the scarification and stratification requirements of those seeds. 
Um, it also means that you can prep the site via solarization in the summer, which is what I recommend. Um, if you are planting plugs, it's going to require less watering, and it'll have it'll give the plugs time to, um, to to really root in and start developing roots before the winter begins. In the spring, you really must prep via the repeat tillage method, which of course releases a lot of carbon. So it's you know it's something that you can do, but solarize if you're able to. Um, it is going to take you another season for some seeds to sprout due to those stratification and scarification needs. Um, and also, you're going to be watering more. Um, your plugs, if you think even of the spring, it's usually somewhat wet. It's been very dry recently. So if you had seeded a meadow the spring, you would need to um, keep that moist and also make sure again, if you were planting plugs that they get planted. So my favorite method, this is what I recommend. And you're actually, if you're thinking about putting an autumn in, or I'm sorry, a meadow in for the autumn, you have, this is the prime time because you have time to do your site prep adequately. So I highly recommend that you solarize and that has to be done in the summer. And in order to prep that, you want to drop your mower deck as low as possible. And you want to be very vicious. And you want to mow, mow, mow. And you want to cut it as low as possible. Then you're going to drench that area with water. You're going to cover it with clear plastic. It has to be clear plastic in order to get hot enough to solarize. And the thickness recommended is one to four mil painter's plastic. Um, you would do that in early June. You would want to overlap it if you're using more than a roll. And the type that comes with the UV protection is very helpful because that's going to minimize tears, rips, openings. If it is a super sandy location and look, you know, we live on Delmarva. I know some of us have clay, but many of us have um, sand in our soil and some of us it's more sandy some of us have more of a loamy mix but if you have a really sandy um seeding area or a plug planting area recommend that you lay out soaker hoses before you drop the plastic um, so that you can periodically water that during the summer and you want to secure the plastic by burying the edges with soil or compost or heavy objects. So it needs to be completely encased. The plastic, you should plan on removing that by mid-September, um, just before your seeding. And you'll want, you'll want to carefully rake any debris that remains on the site before you seed. I cannot emphasize how crucial site prep is, and that's for any project that really can make and break the success of your project. So putting time, investing into site prep is going to help more than pretty much anything else that you do. If you um, are trying to rush in a meadow or you're, you decide you wanna do a spring meadow, you're gonna have to follow the repeat tilling um, method. I recommend beginning this two months before you intend to seed because that will give you long enough to um, repeat the tilling a couple of times. So much like we do when we solarize, we are gonna abuse the lawn or whatever you have growing there. Drop that deck as low as it'll go on the mower, mow it as low as possible. Again, be absolutely ruthless and vicious. Cut it, cut it, cut it. Make sure that you rake away, or if you have like the mulching mower that sucks up the debris, that's great. If not, you'll need to rake it away. You're gonna till and cultivate the seeding area the first time. Then you need to wait two to four weeks and repeat. Basically, you wanna wait long enough that you see some of the seed bank is starting to send up little weeds or little bits of grass. You want it to start growing again before you till it again. So go ahead and till it again, cultivate, 
And then you're going to do that one more time. Wait another two to four weeks, let stuff start growing again, and then repeat it once more. So the reason why we do that is to kill whatever is growing there and then to help exhaust the weeds that are present in the soil. You're going to want to make sure that seeding area is level. And then at that point, the seed area should be relatively clear of any vegetation. You do not want to see tufts of dirt or clumps of weeds growing. So that means the site has not been prepared properly. Um, and if you see that, I would say go ahead and till again. You basically want a clear area. So if you are seeding multiple areas, you're going to want to weigh and mix your wildflower seeds with the cover crop seeds and go ahead and label which mix goes to which place. If you're only seeding one area, which is most of us, then we would just mix all of the seeds together. Um, if you are using a walk behind spreader, like a broadcast spreader, um, you're going to want to just divide it in half. If you are going to be hand seeding, so you put the seeds in a bucket, you carry the bucket around and you're throwing it out like you're throwing scratch to chickens. Um, if you're doing that, go ahead and divide the planting area into quarters and divide the seed mix into quarters. For the spreader, um, you want to make sure that it's closed off before you load the seeds and you want to load about half. I will tell you with the spreader, because of the varying sizes of seeds, you're going to have to experiment a lot because if you open it too much, then you're just going to have seeds spurting out all over the place. Um, if it's too little, then you're not going to have enough seeds exiting the spreader. Um, you can also mix in something like kitty litter or rice hulls. And again, Prairie Moon actually sells rice hulls that you can purchase um, or some sort of filler if you notice that, hey, the spreader is just having too many um, issues with evenly spreading the seed. So that is definitely an issue. If you're hand seeding, it's just, it's, you know, you're a human being. So try to be as even as possible as you walk up and down your rows. Um, but I do recommend a spreader if you have one available. So for the hand seeding, you would divide the area into four grids. You might want to use like some landscaping spray paint so that you actually visually know where your grids are. You're going to walk up and down in rows, whether you're hand scattering or using the spreader. And then you're going to walk back and forth in um, rows as well. So you're going to be going up and down and side to side. So if you're broad, broadcast spreading the seeds, um, once you empty out um, the hopper, you exhaust the first half, go ahead and load it up with the second half and repeat the process. If you're hand seeding, you're just going to do one grid at a time and just refill your bucket as you complete each grid. You do want to walk or roll over the area or rake in the seeds. And if at all possible, um, and again, from personal experience, I tell you this, try to seed when the ground is not saturated. And if it's a wet meadow, it's, that is one of the difficult parts about seeding in the autumn. Um, that soil can be very, very saturated um, and it can, it can make for a difficult process. So, and especially if you've done the tilling process in a wet meadow area, it's, it's going to be a mess. Just prepared, be prepared and wear the correct footwear would be um, my best advice to you. If you're planting with plugs, consider, again, the eventual size of each species. Of course, you have a range of sizes. So just think of that when you're thinking about where you want to put different species. I recommend that you pre-position your plugs and move them around until you're satisfied with the structure and the placement. Again, please plant more densely than recommended than if you were putting in a formal garden. 
I highly recommend, and this is based on research that Heather Holm has done. She does, she's written some very awesome pollinator books that I highly recommend. Um, but she, based on her research, recommends that you plant three foot by three foot areas with the same four species. So the same perennial or annual in that three by three area. That's because some pollinators, if there's only a plant or two, they are not going to bother visiting. It's just not dense enough. They're looking for a certain density of pollen or nectar. So keep that in mind. If you're using plugs, have fun, be creative. Like you can, you can really drill down and think about all of the different colors and bloom times and heights and what you want to see out your window or when you go for a walk during the winter. Your meadow can provide you with such joy all four seasons. So think about that. Don't leave out grasses. I think a lot of times people are like, meh, grasses, I'm not getting a flower, but you're getting all those other things. Like I said before, you're getting seeds, you're getting winter interest, and you're getting um, a great cover for all of the uh, pollinators and little critters in the winter. I do recommend that you throw in some annuals and perennials that will definitely flower the first year, because let's face it, even if we are more patient types, hey, we still want to see some flowers, right? That's one of the reasons why we're planting this, this meadow. So include something like partridge pea, which is, a, again, an annual, self-seeds readily, so it should continue to come up. Think about putting in a, at least one Monarda species, so bee balm, scarlet bee balm, or spotted bee balm. Those, generally speaking, flower the first year. Some other plugs may also flower um, the first full growing season, especially if you planted them in the autumn. You will want to protect the seed bed or the planting area um, with the seed bed, you want to very lightly mulch the seed bed with straw. You do not want to bury it. So you want to thinly scatter it. You want to use, it's a mostly weed-free straw. You can, um, you can go to your big box store and get a commercial seeding bale. There are a couple of different brands. They, generally speaking, include like guar gum, or some other type of tackifier that helps keep the straw in place during the winter. You should see the cover crop popping up just a few weeks after seeding. So before the depth of winter hits, your cover crop's going to be popping up. For the planting area, I highly recommend um, when you're planting plugs, Go ahead and water it thoroughly and add two inches of compost as mulch. That's going to prevent weeds from um, popping up. It's going to retain moisture and it can also help improve the soil health. Maintaining your meadow. You have to maintain any sort of planting project. The meadow is no different. The first year is the special year. So in the seeded areas in the summer, you're gonna to want to mow it three to four times. The reason why we do that is because A, we have a cover crop. We don't want it to continue to seed. So we're gonna lop off any sorts of seed heads um, before they are ready. So probably do your first uh, mowing sometime in, in June, perhaps May, depending on how warm it is that year. Uh, most of our natives are going to put their energy into roots the first year. So when we mow, we're going to mow at a six inch um, height. So your deck should be set to six inches. Your um, natives are going to be growing below that for the most part. You may have a couple of species that um, might get lopped off a little bit, but that's the name of the game the first year. Um, you want to water it as needed, of course. If it's a dry, hot summer, you are going to have to do some supplemental watering. We always say an inch of rain per week. If you don't get that, you need to supplement it. 
for the plug areas the first year. You want to top off your compost in the spring, um, early summer. Make sure that you're maintaining the two inches of mulch. Um, you want to pull any weeds um, that you see growing, any invasive species. What's nice in the plug area, generally speaking, is small enough that you can do that by hand. And you're going to, again, need to water it as needed. Years two and three to infinity, hopefully, um, seeded areas, you need to mow once a year. We recommend that you do that in spring. We specifically recommend that you try to wait until April at some point to give uh, queen bumblebees and some of those early um, rising native bees uh, a chance to uh, get out of the area and uh, start start their foraging process. So you will want to set the deck lower. It needs to be set to two to four inches. That's going to cut off any woody species that try to grow in the area and they will. So that's gonna take care of any trees or shrubs. That's also gonna knock back any invasive plant species that are trying to grow in that area. Mowing's going to prevent su succession from occurring. Um, so that's why we do that. You can also, um, you notice I didn't include it, but you know, if you have the resources, you could also do an annual burn of the area. Uh, planted areas, continue to add that compost annually until the meadow is well established. You want to, if you're going to um, do a plug area, you could switch to mowing annually once it's established. Otherwise you do need to hand weed it. And I recommend doing that, just doing a check once a month, making sure that you remove any trees, um, any shrubs, any invasive plants that you see coming up. Resources, really recommend Owen Wormser's Lawns into Meadows book. It's a great how-to. Um, we put in a couple of meadows at a property last year and his book was very, very helpful um, in terms of making sure um, that we were uh, going on the right path. And particularly his repeat tillage method is what we use. So his book is available at your favorite bookseller. Um, and again, I would recommend it if you were seriously considering putting in a meadow. Um, the other links here, Soil Solarization for Gardens and Landscapes is a PDF. Um, and the handout, I actually just included this entire presentation just because there's so much information. So when you get the PDF, just click on that if you want to open the PDF. Um, planting for Pollinators, Establishing a Wildlife Meadow from Seed. That is another PDF and it is linked. The link is embedded in the handout PDF that you will um, receive. Also, native plug vendors. So environmental concern, I believe that was on Sydney's list. They are based out of St. Michael's, Maryland. They do have a retail operation, um, although their primary business is wholesale. And I also recommend um, Izel Plants, which is a native plant co-op. So a lot of different vendors who only do larger wholesale, they sell through retail, through Izel plants. And what's nice is you can get a lot of good uh, deep plugs from Izel plants. The price includes shipping. Shipping um, has always been UPS. And I have to say the plants that I have gotten from the vendors that I've ordered from, I've been extremely happy with. So I do recommend them and checking them out. Seed vendors, again, earned seeds, best for bulk seeds and cover crops. Prairie Moon has some great seed mixes. Plus, if you want to start your own plugs, they have an awesome selection of individual um, species seeds. Very reasonably priced. Any questions from anyone? All right. Well, hello everyone. My name is Sydney Williams. I'm the education coordinator at Nanakoke Watershed Alliance. Uh, and today we're gonna talk about tree-rific homes. 
So basically we're just gonna talk about um, how plants can benefit you, a little overview of how they benefit the environment and how they can benefit um, wildlife. Some of the environmental benefits of trees, um, trees combat climate change, uh, they clean the air, they provide oxygen and they help prevent water pollution. Uh, trees also help prevent soil erosion. Um, they support the lives of many organisms. Uh, trees are used for food, uh, shelter as sites of reproduction, and many animals also use trees as a place to rest, um, for nesting, and places for uh, which they can capture prey. So some of the ways that um, our native trees are directly uh, connected to our native, some of our native species is that they, some of our native species require these trees in order to reproduce. So they're the host trees, it's where they lay their eggs and their larva, uh, larva need these trees to uh, feed on. So the zebra swallowtail and the pawpaw tree, uh, the eastern swallowtail and the tulip poplar and spice bush swallowtail and sassafras and also the spice bush tree for that particular butterfly. So it's really important that those trees are around so that we can continue to have um, these beautiful pollinating butterflies around as well. So what can the, what can native trees do for you? They provide shade, uh, they conserve energy. Um, just three full grown trees in your yard can cut your energy costs by 30% in the summer. Um, they can also keep the area around your house cooler. Uh, if you have trees near your like sidewalks or your uh, driveway, uh, it'll shade those areas so they aren't um, absorbing as much heat and releasing that kind of backup near your house. Uh, they help reduce flooding and erosion in your yard. So um, the leaf canopies help reduce erosion that's caused by the falling rain. And they also, the leaves provide a surface area where the rain lands and evaporates, so less of that's getting into your yard. Uh, and then what, if you do have standing water in your yard, uh, the roots help uptake uh, some of that water. So through infiltration, they'll, they'll suck that water up so you won't have sitting water in your yard as long. Um, they also make your house more beautiful and they can increase property values by up to 15%. So this is a little um, infographic. In the back to the north side, there's um, evergreens planted, which are really good against winds, um, cold winds in the winter. So they help keep your house warmer by acting as a wind block. And they should always be planted on the north side of your home if you're using them for that purpose. Because if, if you do plant them on the south or west side, uh, they can block warming sunlight during the winter since they keep their, their leaves through the winter. Uh, and then you want to plant deciduous trees on the south and west side of your house since that's where you get the most intense sunlight coming from in the summer. The leaves will shade your house and help keep um, it cooler. Uh, it'll also keep the area around your house cooler in your yard by providing shade. Um, you might even have to water less because of this, it'll slow evaporation and keep that moisture on your lawn or your garden for longer in the day. Choose the right tree for the right location. So you wanna think about what is your soil type? You can get a soil test and find out what kind of soil you have so you can pick a tree best suited for it or if you need to make amendments to your soil. Um, and you, I have provided a link at the end for that if you wanna get a soil test. Uh, you wanna think about what the climate zone of your area is. We're in climate zone 7A, so you wanna make sure whatever trees you plant can thrive in that, in that area, in that growing climate. Um, you wanna think about how much water it will need and where you plant it, how easy it will be to get water to it. And um, should you plant evergreen or deciduous? So that, talked about that a little. So that depends on what you, want to get out of your, your tree. And then the size or shape of tree can also affect, uh, you don't wanna plant like a very large tree too close to your house or um, maybe too small of a tree. Okay. Uh, and then, the, so we're just gonna go into planting and caring for your tree. So I combine them both uh, into one. So the before and after care. 
So the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is weed. You wanna remove all the grass and weeds that are growing around the tree uh, in a three to four foot wide circle. And then after you cleared the weed, you can use a cultivator to loosen the topsoil and allow for better infiltration of water. So you don't want it to be compacted. You want water to be able to get in there to the roots so that the tree can uptake the water and survive. Then you wanna dig a hole for your tree. Um, so you're gonna measure the height of the root ball and dig a hole as deep as the height and then two to three times as wide. And then place the tree in the hole and turn it so that it's centered. So you want the root, the root ball to be uh, either level or one inch above the ground. And then trees can come in three different like container types. So you have bare root trees, which will need to be soaked before they're planted for 30 to 60 minutes. Uh, you could have containers like in the illustration here. So um, that's pretty easy. You just pull it out of the container and then you can have bald and burlaps. So with a bald and burlap tree, um, you wanna make sure the tree is in position in the hole already before you remove anything. Once you have the tree in position, um, it's usually wrapped with wire or something to keep the burlap on. Uh, use wire cutters and cut vertically up the side and then um, just peel it off or pull it off after you've cut it. And then you wanna remove all the rope and twine from around the root ball and any nails that are holding the burlap together. Uh, and then you're gonna pull the burlap um, back and cut away any of the loose material and pull the rest down. Uh, it's okay if you leave some of the burlap underneath the root ball, unless it's the vinyl or the treated burlap, then you wanna make sure you remove it completely. Uh, so after you have it out of your container or out of your burlap, you want to make sure you massage the root ball on all sides to loosen the roots. Uh, you want to prune any roots that are circling back to the point which they turn. So if it goes all the way around and comes back to that point, you want to make sure you prune that. Um, or if they're flexible enough and you can get them untangled, pull them out and then pack them down into the soil. Uh, also at this point, you'll want to remove um, they're called tree suckers down here at the bottom on this illustration. You wanna make sure you prune those off as well. So they wanna check your planting depth. Um, if it's too shallow, the roots will appear around the base of the tree. You wanna cover those um, to keep them from becoming exposed again. So they'll, they'll start to get scaly, they'll start to get bark on them if they're above the ground. So you wanna make sure you cover it before that happens. Uh, if it's too deep, you wanna follow it down to the soil uh, the trunk flare is not exposed, the, the very bottom where the trunk widens a little, um, then it's planted too deep. So you're going to either want to, if you haven't already backfilled your hole, um, you can pull the tree out and put some more soil underneath. If you've already backfilled, you'll have to pull that away with a small hand tool and just make sure you get it back far enough from that trunk that it's not going to cover it again. Then you want to backfill. Um, so as you are backfilling, you want to just make sure you're pushing down the soil using either your heel or the handle of the shovel. Uh, you don't want to press down too hard, but enough that you get rid of any air pockets because you don't want it to be too compacted that water can't get down to the uh, bottom of the root ball. And then you want it to be one inch above the soil when you're complete. Okay. Then you're going to want to plant or build a berm. Uh, a berm is it should be created just outside the root ball about four to six inches high on a new tree. If it's older than a year, you should extend it to the drip line of the tree, which is just an imaginary um, line from the canopy to the ground, which in this picture here. So you want your berm to extend out to these points. So it helps keep water in, in the immediate area of the roots. Then you're gonna to wanna to water your tree. Um, so to check if it needs water, you just wanna dig down a little, pull up some soil, uh, try to squeeze it into a ball. If it doesn't stay together, then it needs water. If it stays together, then it doesn't need water. Uh, so if it does need water, slowly give the tree 15 to 20 gallons of water or whatever the specific requirements are for that tree. And then lastly, you're gonna to wanna to mulch. So you want a three to four inch layer um, over the exposed soil around the berm and the base of the tree but make sure to pull the mulch back three to five inches from the tree trunk. So you don't want it sitting 
right up against the trunk of the tree. And this is just a quick um, like overview for you in the guide. And then I'm just gonna talk about a few different trees. I pick them based on benefit to a homeowner on your property, um, their wildlife value, and then also just how they look aesthetically. And then also in the guide, um, you can click on the names and that will take you to a page with much more information, a lot of in-depth information about each of these species. Um, so you can grow the red maple in full or part sun, um, medium to wet soil, clay or sand. It's not super picky. Uh, it can get pretty, pretty large. Um, it does flower March through April, April. Uh, and it's a great, um, a great source of early nectar and pollen for pollinators uh, or for species such as our native mining bee, the males will actually look to mate with females around this tree early in the year. Um, and they do love water. So if you do have flooding, they are a good tree to choose for your yard. Um, they also are a large shade tree. They have very beautiful fall color. Uh, I will, say they have a shallow root system. So you don't wanna plant this too close to a walkway or a structure or a driveway because it could cause issues as the tree matures. Um, they also are enjoyed by squirrels and a variety of birds. Young trees are browsed by deer. So you're gonna to wanna to cage it so that deer can't get to it um, and rabbits too. And next we have the tulip poplar. Uh, it's a quite large tree can grow up to 150 feet in height in its ideal conditions, but usually it'll only grow between 70 and 100 feet. Uh, and it's full or part sun, uh, loam or sand soil. It has these beautiful flowers that are enjoyed by ruby-throated hummingbirds. Um, they're also browsed by rabbits and young deer. So again, you're gonna wanna cage young trees. Uh, the seeds also provide a source of food in fall, the fall through the winter for birds and mammals. And with the, the white oak, so again, it's sun to part sun. Uh, this tree does not like uh, to be wet, so dry to medium soil. Uh, if you really want to plant an oak tree in your yard, but it's, it's wet, there's like swamp oak, which will do a lot better in a, in a wet yard. Um, Again, it's a really nice shade tree. Thinking about, you know, decreasing your cooling costs. Uh, the acorns are also a great food source for many mammals and large birds. The leaf buds are also eaten by birds. Um, and a nice thing about the white oak is the leaves persist longer than many other types of deciduous trees in the area. So they provide cover longer than most of the deciduous trees would. And we have flowering trees. So the Eastern Redbud, uh, it doesn't get very tall, 20 to 35 feet, but it still is a good shade tree. Uh, it needs part sun to shade. Uh, it doesn't like to be wet either, so dry to medium soil. Uh, it flowers April through May, which is important as Beth was saying, when these early pollinators come up, they are hungry, they're looking for food. So it's, uh, especially for bees, it's a really great source of pollen and nectar when it's scarce. Uh, they're very attractive trees, right? The bright pink to purple blooms are, they're very beautiful, very bright. Uh, and the leaves are heart-shaped. So after the blooms go away, you'll get the leaves. Uh, the seed pods are also eaten by cardinals, uh, many other songbirds, turkeys, deer, and squirrels. And black cherries, this one can get pretty big too, up to 75 feet, so it's also a good shade tree. Uh, they're very pretty, they smell nice. They'll make, you know, they're, they're a nice um, decorative tree as well. They're a great source of nectar for our native bees, flies, and ants. They actually provide food for over 33 species of birds. Um, they're the, it's the larval host for many butterfly and moth species, including the Eastern tiger swallowtail. Um, I do want to say the berries are edible on this tree, but the rest of the tree can cause, they're highly toxic. So I don't know if I would 
eat them as a note um, or make sure your pets don't eat them. It can cause issues for them. Okay. Uh, and then we have flowering dogwood. So it can grow 20 to 50 feet in height and needs part sun. Again, dry to medium, so it doesn't like to be sitting in, in wet soil. Um, it's, a, it's a very pretty tree. Uh, it's a great source of nectar for native bees. Oh, sorry. Uh, many insects, birds, and mammals use it as a food source. Sorry. Um, and then bees, flies, and butterflies feed on the nectar and collect the pollen. Uh, the fruit are, is also an important source of food in late summer and early fall for many songbirds. Uh, and unfortunately, white-tailed deer and rabbits also like this tree, so you want to make sure you cage young trees so they don't get nibbled down to nothing. And some of the evergreen trees, we have the eastern red cedar and the eastern white pine. The Eastern red cedar can get up to 75 feet. Um, it says full sun, but it can actually, it can tolerate part sun and shade. Um, it can really tolerate wet um, soils as well as dry to medium. Uh, it's also salt tolerant. So if you live in an area um, where it's a brackish marshy site and your yard gets wet from that. Um, this tree will do just fine there. Uh, the fruit uh, uh, that this tree produces, they're a staple source of food uh, for many birds and small mammals, including the cedar waxwing songbird, which was named after this tree. Then we have white pine, which is also, uh, I didn't mention, this is a really great tree for windbreaks because it it is so dense and the, um, it keeps its, its needles all year long. And same with the Eastern White Pine. It's a really good, it's dense. It keeps its needles. It's a really good windbreak. Uh, the pine cones are a great source of food for squirrels and birds. Uh, it does require full sun. It likes to be dry or dry to medium soil. Uh, it likes loamy soil. It can grow up to about hundred feet tall. Uh, and you'll see the flowers May through July, and then August through October, it will produce pine cones. And then just some resources, uh, how to plant the tree and care for trees. So it's a step-by-step -step guide, it's super helpful. Um, it's really clearly laid out, easy to follow. Here's soil testing in Delaware. It's the um, Delaware University Extension. Maryland has one too, but their website, they've taken that off their website. So I don't know if it's up and running right now. Um, and then these are some of the sources we already shared with where to look for native plants, um, find out more about them, and then where to buy native plants. And then thank you for, for listening and I can answer any questions anyone has.